Hello and welcome to 6502 Assembly Language Programming on the Commodore 128. Um, this video is going to kick off a new project. Um, this is going to be a little different than um, previous ones, I think, because um, this one isn't a game and it's not anything um, particularly flashy for the screen. This is going to be mostly heavy calculations. Um, it's an SHA 256 hash calculator and um, mostly what it's going to do is just a lot of bit shifting, a lot of adding, anding, oring, a lot of logical operations and uh, we're, going to see, we're going to see how hard this is to do. Um, I came, I came up with the idea of a couple of, th a couple of reasons. Um, one is that there is a site called Rosetta Code where anybody can contribute um, solutions to particular to various problems written in different languages. And there are some program there are some some entries there for 6502, uh, but not a lot. And this is one that hasn't been um, filled in yet. So um, I could so it'd be a chance to put some up there. I've, I've been wanting to do something for that site, and uh, this would be a chance to do something. Another reason was that uh, someone on the on an assembly forum was asking what would be involved in trying to make a program, an assembly language program that would um, translate text using Google Translate. And I explained, well, to do that, you would have to basically write a, a, a simple HTTP client that would be able to talk to a web server, because that's, <clears throat> that's how the Google Translate API would, you'd need to talk to it, as if you're you know, basically a web browser, but a very simple one. You need to be able to talk to it, send it requests, and then parse the data that comes back and so since they were they were asking about an 8086 machine which is about the same time period as the 6502 it's mid eight mid to late 80s i guess and most of the machines that had an 8086 did not have any kind of networking just like the commodores back then didn't have any kind of networking just nobody was thinking that way yet for the, those kind of systems um and so odds are they wouldn't even have a network stack. They'd have to write an entire network stack. And so I was kind of explaining how, you know, for somebody who sounded like a beginner, this was a, a pretty big project they would be taking on. And then somebody else chimed in to say, not to mention SSL, because a lot of a lot of sites now are requiring that you connect with HTTPS, which is the the S, SSL encrypted form of HTTP, which means you would need to write an SSL stack for your program too. And that's a lot of really heavy computation. A lot of math has to go on um, to every every block that you transmit or take take in has to go through all these calculations. So I thought, well, how about something? How about something a little smaller? How about just a hash calculator? Um, and so I went and got the the publication, the spec on SHA two fifty six because it's a fairly common one. Um, let's see if we just do just as an example hello world through SHA 256 you if you take any chunk of text anything from just a word to a huge file and you run it through an SHA 256 hash calculator you get a hash like this this is to a 256 byte or two, sorry 256 bit hash represented in hexadecimal um, I guess, yeah, 64, 64 bytes. Um, and if you change something, then you get a completely different hash. That's one of the one of the reasons or one of the concepts is a, a good hash will give you a completely different hash, even though there's only been a small change in the data that you're hashing. So that's one of the that's one of the purposes. Um, well, that's not really a purpose. That's a requirement. The purposes are, one, to be able to come up with a unique or basically almost certain to be unique hash that identifies the data so that if I give you this hash and then you check it against the data by running the data through the hash calculator yourself, you can be sure that the data didn't change between, you know, that I didn't give you false data or somebody in the middle didn't intercept it and change it because it still matches the hash. because these hashes are so long that it's like you could you could uh, you know 
we could have a billion computers making billions of hashes for another billion years and you still wouldn't run into the same hash twice um, just because the numbers are so large. Um, and the other thing is a good hash shouldn't be able, you shouldn't be able to figure out what the data was from the hash. And so that's why the hash needs to be very randomized to where um, if the data changes even a little bit, the hash changes completely. And so you can't go back, you can't like try different data, you know, try different inputs and look at the outputs and then be able to figure out from an output back to an input. So that's the idea, to be able to take a chunk of data and write our, write our own um, SHA-256 hash calculator for the 128. <clears throat> so what's going to make this, the main difficulty with this is going to be that modern computers and, the, and these algorithms that are being written to do things like this all assume that you can handle um, that you can handle values 32 bits at a time, that you have 32-bit registers at least, if not 64 or 128, but all, all your modern processors have at least 32-bit registers. Well, we only have 8-bit registers, so we're going to have to deal with numbers a fourth at a time, one byte at a time, but all the numbers we're going to be dealing with are going to be 32-bit numbers. Um, started a notes file here. So all values are 32-bit, which is 4 bytes. So anytime we handle two values, like if we want to add two values together, we've actually got to add four pairs of bytes together and carry and, and handle the carry along the way. <clears throat> and so that's going to add some complication to this. Um, but that's okay. That's kind of the point. Um, what else do we need to know? I took a I took the publication that explains it the, the spec and uh, trimmed it down to just the parts on SHA two fifty six because it it actually had several different SHA versions in the file and so a lot of it didn't apply to what we're doing so I just have a five page document here that just has what we need um, so. So part of this is going to be figuring out, okay, we've got all these different 4-byte values that have got to be stored. Which ones are we going to store where? Because we've talked before about zero page, how zero page is the best place to store things because it's because it's faster to access, but we're going to have more stuff than we can put in zero page. So we've got to get things sorted out. So let's talk about the values that we're going to have to deal with. Um, there are the hash values which we'll just call hash um, 1 through 8. Again, each one of these is a 4-byte or 32-bit value. There's going to be 8 of those, actually. It'll be 0 through 7, where everything, everything is 0, or starts at 0. These will all start out with a particular hash value that is just set by the standard, and that's what's at the, that's what's at the top of this page right here. So... I don't think I can, no, I can't paste that in here. That's okay. I'll, I'll copy that stuff over later. But these are just, these are just set hash values. It says they're, these come from taking the first 32 bits of the fractional parts of the square roots of the first eight prime numbers. I don't know if that has any magical significance. I think it's just they wanted random numbers, basically, that could be replicated. So if you, you know, if you, if you figured out the, square roots of the first eight prime numbers and then took the first two thir 32 bits of the fractional parts of each one, you'd have the same thing. Um, so we have our hash values, which are going to start with those values and then they're going to end up with whatever we end up with. We have eight working variables, or yeah, working variables. These are the ones, and these hash values wouldn't need to be in zero page because they're only going to be accessed. Well, we'll come back to that. Let's let's come back to that. So eight working variables. I'm going to call these AA to HH because um, I think they'll stand out a little better with those names than if I just name them A through H like they do in the in the document here. Um, these would definitely be best in zero page because these are where we're going to do most of the calculating. 
you have 64 constants, which we'll see in a little bit, so 0 through 63. And since there's 64 of them, and they take four bytes a piece, that's 256 bytes, so that takes one page of memory. And we'll, we'll just put those somewhere. They don't need to be in zero page. They wouldn't fit in. I mean, they would take up all of zero page. So, um, see, these, these eight take up 32 bytes. So we can fit that in zero page somewhere. We can't fit 256 bytes because that's all of zero page. Um, we have something called working memory or working, what do they call it? They call it um, the message schedule. I don't know why it's a weird name for it. But anyway, um, they, they call it W, but the name of it is the message schedule. So we'll call it WW. Um, this is we'll get to the we'll get to the way this is figured in a bit but <clears throat> this is basically a place where it takes a block of the the incoming message and then runs it through a bunch of filters to sort of scramble it and then that chunk that block which ends up being four times the size of the original block ends up being the thing that the hash calculations work on so it's sort of it's a preprocessor thing to give us a, a sort of a scrambled up bunch of data to work on. So this is also going to be 256 bytes because this has six, 64 words. Um, no, sorry. I get the bit. I get. The, they talk about bits a lot, and we're going to be talking more about bytes. And then sometimes they talk about words, and so it, it does get confusing. Um, But that's going to be, let's see, yeah, that's going to be, yeah, right, that's going to be 64 words, and each word is 4 bytes, so that's going to be um, 256 bytes. So again, just like the constants, each constant is one word, which a word is 4 bytes in, in, their, in their terminology. Um, so that's going to be one page somewhere also. What I'm thinking is, what we might do, is these constants aren't going to change. They're going to stay the same all through the, the calculation. The, this section will change all the time. So I think we're going to stick that in screen memory so that we can see it working. Even though it'll, it'll just look like random garbage, but it'll be kind of neat. Um, and what else? We have a T1 and a T2. Um, which are four bytes each, and they should be in zero page because those are basically temporary um, locations, temporary calculation locations. Um, whoops. What else? Um, we'll need other temporary locations, but we'll, we'll have to kind of figure out how many as we go through. All right. Now some things to talk about, so I'll go back up to, we'll say other temp locations, four bytes each, zero page, okay, because any other temp locations are going to be used a lot in the calculations, and so we'll want them in zero page. Okay, so some other notes, um, symbols, I think these are fairly straightforward, but this one means and. Um, this in in, the, in their document, um, I can't even make that thing, whatever that is. But I guess we don't need to go through as in document. Fortunately, we don't have to do any fancy math. We don't have to do any math. We don't have to do any multiplication or division or anything like that. All we need, all we have to do is logic and ors and xors, um, a complement which is xor with with all ones. Um, addition and shifting, rot rotating and shifting. That's all we have to do. So we have um, we have operands for all this stuff. Um, it's just going to, so we don't have to like write multiplication routines or anything like that. Um, 
addition is modulo 2 to the um, 2 to the, in this case, 64th. Um, what that means is that if we add two things together, if we add two 32-bit numbers together and we get a 33-bit number, we just drop the 33rd bit. We, we just we just discard it so we don't have to somehow have extra space for that or whatever. If we add two 32-bit numbers, we just want the lower 32 bits of the answer. Um, we've got some operations, rotate left, rotate right, and shift right. These are similar to operands that we have, but we're going to have to be a little bit creative because our like like R O R O T R and then they give it a, and then they'll give it a number like say 3 and then do that on the x value what that means is to rotate the x value 3 times to the left 3 times to the right 3 bits to the right take all the bits and shift them to the right with the one on the right each time coming around to the left now our rotate in the 6502, R -O -R -R -O -R goes through the carry bit. So when we rotate on the 6502, it's really a nine bit rotate. And the carry bit is one of those bits. And so the, the bit that goes, that gets rotated off the right end, drops into the carry flag, and the carry flag gets pulled in on the left end. So when we do this, we don't want the carry flag involved. We just want to rotate the bit off the right end right into the left end without having to you know, without having to go through the carry. So what we're gonna have to do is not really too complicated, but basically again remember that every value here is going to be four bytes. So we're gonna have to rotate byte number one and then rotate byte number two, which will pull in the carry from number one, rotate byte number three, pulling in the carry from number two, rotate byte number four, pulling in the carry from number three and then we'll decide based on the carry from number four whether we're going to stick a one or a zero in the top of the first byte. Um, that'll make more sense when we do it. I'll, I'll probably draw it out at the time. Um, and SHA-256 doesn't actually use rotate left, but we may want to use it because rotate left is the same thing as rotate or rotate left the same thing as rotate right um, thirty two minus n times meaning if we want to rotate right twenty two times we can rotate left 10 times and it does the same thing. It accomplishes the same thing. Because remember, we're just going around in a circle here. So if you take, if you, you know, you take all the bits around that are around a circle, if you turn it one direction a certain distance, that's the same result as turning it the other direction the same amount, you know, enough that it comes back to the same position. So we might want a rotate left because as we get a little further here we're going to see that there are times we're going to rotate right 22 times or 25 times and if we actually do that 22 or 25 times that's going to be a longer calculation than if we wrote a, than if we had a rotate left that we could just do 10 times or 7 times um, so anytime it's more than 16 we might want to flip it and go the other direction because then it's less less calculating and then the shift operation that's a, that's even simpler because a shift just a shift doesn't rotate it just shifts everything to the right and pulls in the zero is at the left end no big deal so i'll just say shift is easy all right now here's where we start to get into the actual functions And they give some of them fancy Greek letters, so we're gonna we're gonna simplify these down to um, names we can actually type into our assembler. I'm not gonna try to use sigma and you know capital one and small sigma in a in an assembler. 
So we've got six functions here, and we will be using them all. Um, the first one they call ch, so we'll just we'll call it fch. I'm going to call all the functions f something. Um, so fchxyz means you you give it three values. So we're going to be giving it three four byte values to work on. And what it does is it takes x and y, so that's the first value anded by the second value, and it XORs, exclusive ORs that with the result of um, not x, which just means x inverted, all the ones switch to zeros and all the zeros switch to ones, and z. So that's what that function does. It's going to, if you give it three things, and we'll see later that we're always going to be given that one, um, E, F, and G from our, from our eight working variables. Um, <clears throat> uh, where am I? So we'll be giving it E, F, and G, and so it's going to and E and F, and it's going to take E here and flip, its, flip all of its bits. And in fact, let's just let's since we're always giving it e, f, and g, let's just do that. E, f, g. This is e. This is f. This is e, and this is f. So, um, so it's going to and e and f. Save that somewhere. Then it's going to take e, flip all of its bits. Which to flip e's bits, we exclusive or e with with the value ff um, that's how you do that and then once you once you do that then you're going to end it with f the value f not the the variable f this is a this is a hard coded value right here and then once you've got that you're going to exclusive or it to the original thing that we came up with here so that's that function now we have function madge I have no idea why these have the names they do. Now, madge is always called on, let's see here, A, B, and C. So again, let's just use A, B, and C instead of X, Y, and Z. And this is going to take, again, we're going to have A and B, exclusive or that result with A and C and exclusive or that with B and C. So all that one does is takes each pair of the three, A and B and B and C and A and C, takes each pair, ends them together, and then exclusive orders those together. Um, and that gives you the, the result of the function madge. Now these other three, I'm just going to name them F1, F2, F3, and F4. Um, f1 of x. Now these these only work on one va one value this time. You're not combining three different values. So the first one is rotate r twice. I can't do superscripts here, or at least I'm not going to try. So we'll uh, and then exclusive or is that with rotate r 13 times. And exclusive or is that with rotate r 22 times. Um, so you, it's going to rotate, it's going to take the, the value that is x, which, let's see, that's sigma 0, let's see which one that works on. That one works on a, it looks like. Right here. I think that's, I guess that's the only time it gets, gets used. Yeah. So that one works on A. So we can, instead of saying X, we'll just say A. Okay. Function 2 on, let's see, this one now, sigma, big sigma 1 operates on E, 
so E, and this one is rotate R six times. Um, I guess I don't need to. I don't need to put in the the thing because it's always the same. Let's just do this. Rotate R six times, exclusive or that with rotate R. 11 times and exclusive or that with rotate R 25 times. All right. Because in these, we're, all, we're always working on the same value, so I don't need to just repeat the value every time. Function 3, this is a little sigma 0. Uh, where do we use that? Okay, that's used up here in this. Okay, now this will vary, so I'm just going to have to use X here um, on both of these because this, this isn't the same value every time. Um, so that if you do this on X, you're getting rotate R7 exclusive OR, rotate R18 exclusive OR, and then shift to the right three times. And the other one, function four, rotate R17, exclusive OR, rotate R19, exclusive OR, and shift right 10 times. So you can probably kind of start to get an idea how much calculating is going on here, how much bit shifting, because every time you know you come along, you're gonna to have to have a routine that says, you know, move, you know, move these bits, rotate these bits. Um, and these functions are going to get called over and over and over in the process of processing a message. Okay. Message padding. The, the SHA 256 requires that the message be um, that the message equal a multiple of 512 bits. Um, and so if it's not already exactly that, or well, I guess even if it is already exactly that, it pads the end of it. And they show right here how that gets padded. Um, they take the length, they take whatever the message is, which is the data, like before I, I gave it hello world. So you would take hello world, or in this example here, they take just ABC. They take that particular chunk of data, they add a one after it, just a single bit, a single one bit, and I think the reason for that is probably just because that way it can it can do an empty message. There, it's not entirely empty. There's something there to work on. So you take whatever the whatever the data is, however many bytes, stick a one after it, and then at the very end has to go a 64 bit, so an eight byte chunk that holds the length of the original message. So in this case, this original message was three bytes long, which is 24 bits. And so they put the value 24 on the end here in a 64 bit um, value. And then in between this one that comes after the message and this 64 bit length value, you put however many zero bits you need to pad the thing out so that the whole thing is in 512-bit blocks. Um, so what we're going to have to do is, um, I mean that'll have, have to be that'll have to be part of the part of the program, um, just to pad the message out and give it that structure so that we add um, add a one add the length at the end and then pad it out so that it all equals 512 bits. Um, so let me put that down here real quick. Um, data must be in 512 bit blocks and a 512 bit block is 64 bytes so um, add a 1 bit after original message put a put an 8 byte length value at end 
that's 8 byte or 64 bit so your message can be up to whatever the whatever the value whatever length that whatever largest possible value of that is to the 64th minus one um, huge um, and then pad between one bit and length with zeros zeros to make blocks come out right at 512 bits all right so that'll be you know that'll be part of the pro part of the program they'll have to write is it'll have to be able to to pad that out the thing to note is that since the length at the end is 8 bytes and you have to add at least that one bit you know our messages on on the Commodore our messages are always going to come in bytes and so we're never going to have like a couple extra bits we're always going to have you know whatever we load it's going to be in bytes and so that one bit is always going to be in the next byte um, just like in the example here and so that one bit plus the eight byte length at the end you're always going to need at least nine more bytes after your message and so then we'll just have to do a little bit of math to figure out okay does that mean we can fit our five you know does that mean we can fit that in the current 512 or are we going to have to add another another 512 bit block on the end and pad it on out through that one so that'll be a little bit of fun to figure out okay now this part on now we're now we're finally getting to the part about how do we actually hash the message we've got some we've got our functions here but that's just kind of those are just kind of a start um, hash a message Okay, pre-processing, we need to set up the initial hash values, which like I said, those are going to be those values that were back up here at the top of the file, these eight values, those are where your hashes will start. Your, your eight hash values will start with those eight. and those will have to be copied. They'll just be at the end of our program somewhere and then they'll get copied into the working area where we're going to actually use them um, because then they will change every time we process a block. Um, and pad the, pad the um, message. Okay. Then we get to the computation. So the pre-processing stuff you only have to do once. Then after that, everything else here you do repeatedly for each message block. When they talk about message blocks, that means a 512-bit block. So every message gets broken up into one or more 512-bit blocks. And everything we do here, we're gonna the, the next steps here are gonna get done on each block. Um, and remember, um, each step. gets done on each 512 bit block of M which is your whole message so M1 is your first block M2 is your second block and so on up to N MN which is your final block so they say for I equals 1 to N that just means for each block that we've got to go through so the first thing we do is prepare the message schedule and that's our W which I think I called WW now what happens here is you you've got we've got a 512 bit block which remember 512 bits is 64 bytes so we're gonna turn that into a message schedule which is 256 bytes um, and so that's four times the size. What happens here, what they're showing is first the fir first the the 64 bytes of the incoming message that 512-bit block 
just gets copied into the first 64 bytes of the message schedule, or W. So the first 16 words, if you want to think of it in words, or if you want to think of it in bytes, it's the first 64, they just get copied. But after that, then you start doing this formula on them, which pulls in the previous ones to calculate the other ones. And so you use like t minus 2, t minus 7, t minus 40, or 15, and t minus 16. So you're using previous chunks of the you know, previous words in the message schedule to calculate the next words in the message schedule and that fills out the rest of the message schedule until you have a full 256 bytes or 64 words of message schedule to then calculate on. Um, so we prepare the message schedule. We copy the 64 bytes of um, M1 or well let's say MI the let's say next block of M into WW okay. into first 64 of WW okay. and then we need to do let's see for the other for the next um, 48 words of M block we need to do this thing. So WW of I or the the ith the ith word of WW is going to equal um, O sub one, which was our F four of WW. Um, let's use brackets here. T minus two. Yeah, T minus two. Let's let's put a WWT. Okay, so we do function four up there on the value that's two back from this one, and we add that to the value that's seven back from this one, and we add that to um, let's see. We add that to function three on the WW value, or the WW that's 15 back from this one. And we add that to the WW that is 16 back from this one. So you're doing a function on two of the values that you previously set up, and you're also just adding in two of the other values that you previously set up. You're adding them all together, and then that's one of your new things. Okay, so once you've done all that, then you have your message schedule, which is a one block, 256 byte um, chunk of stuff. 64 words, if you think of it in four byte words, you've got 64 words there in your message schedule from zero to 63. Okay, then, that, so that's prepared the message schedule. Um, then you initialize AA through HH with their matching hash values. So if you take the original, you take the first time, they're just going to get filled with these right here that the hashes start with. After that, these are going to change, and so then the A through H will get get changed also but basically this is just you're taking the the results of the previous well, we'll see in a bit you're basically just taking the results of the previous um, process and starting from those and, and going on so this is just going to be a simple calculation of or a simple copy of 32 bytes from one or not 32 bytes yeah 32 bytes from one place to another place from where the hashes are stored to where the working variables are stored. So we'll just say copy. Okay. So that was step two. 
Now step three is probably the most complicated one. Um, for step three, you loop 64 times. Well, you loop zero to 63. And basically you're doing a series of calculations and copies here on each of your constants and each well each each word in your message schedule combined with a bunch of other stuff plus one of the constants that that's set up or that's set up at the start um, according to this according to these formulas here so <clears throat> this is where you're going to use the big sigma um, formulas and so you're going to get T1 equals H plus, I may have to go back and take out the double letters because I'm I already, I'm just thinking in single letters. That might be easier that way. Um, that doesn't matter. That's just a labeling issue. Um, this sigma 1 here, that was F2 because it's the one that operates on E plus FCH which operates on E, F, and G, plus the constant, the constant that's numbered T, or the, the Tth um, indexed constant, and the Tth um, word of the message schedule. So you calculate T sub 1. Then you calculate T sub 2. And this one uses F1, which operates on A and adds to that our F major function, which operates on A, B, and C. Okay. Now you get to this section where, if, if you look at these, each one is getting copied to the next one in the list, to the next one in the row. If you think of them as A through H in a row, right here, G is getting copied to H, F is getting copied to G, E to F, D to E, but then T1 is getting added to that, C to D, B to C, A to B, and then we make a new A. So it's kind of like everything is just getting ro rolled down a row. So really what we can do here is we can copy since they happen in this order, we can just take them all and copy them four bytes down the row. Since they're going to be in a row in memory, we can just take and say, okay, we're going to take what's in, the, in A through G, shift it four bytes up so that it's sitting at B through, through H. So we're going to copy A through G to B through H. Then we just have two things left to do. One is that we have to add T sub 1 to E. To e. And then A gets to be T sub 1 plus T sub 2. So we have to do that loop 64 times. One time for every one time for every word in the message schedule. Okay. And that brings us to step four which is fairly simple because now we just add A through G to their respective hashes. Um, so A goes to the first hash, B to the second hash, C to the third hash, and so on. And then when you get to the end, you just put the hashes in a row, your eight hashes in a row, and print them out, and there's your hash. So. with all blocks, print the hashes in 0 through 7 order, and you should have the answer. Okay. So if that sounded like a whole lot of garbage, <laughs> it, uh, it kind of is. I mean, it's, it's a ton of shifting things around, and, and the thing is, modern day processors, like I say, since they have 32-bit registers, a lot of this isn't a big deal. You can say, okay, 
drop drop a value in this register, exclusive or it with this other register, and then and that with this other register, or whatever, you know, whatever it is you're doing. We're going to have a much tougher time of it because we're going to have to say if we need to and two two values together, we're going to have to and the first two bytes, and then and the second two bytes, and then and the third two bytes, and then and the fourth byte. So we're going to have a lot of do this thing four times um, to do, and we're also going to have to, we're also going to have a lot of store the you know do this thing and then store that value because we need we need to do this thing four times and we can't just keep the previous value in in the accumulator in a register because we've you know we've got to move on and do other bytes at the same time so it's going to be interesting um, I think like I said um, our values we'll put these we'll put the eight working variables in zero page we might put the hashes in zero page. Um, we definitely can't put the constants there because they'll take a full page. We can't put the working area there because it takes a full page. We'll definitely put T1 and T2 in zero page. And we'll have some other temp locations that we'll just have to decide on when we need them. So we're going to use a, we're going to use a chunk of zero page, but I think we can find enough locations. Um, I was looking through the uh, memory map the other day and there are a lot of locations in zero page that are only used by like the floating point calculator or the cassette um, the cassette reader or you know various things that we are not gonna you know, we don't have to worry about um, and some other ideas call these neat ideas we'll put the working area in screen memory so we can see it process we can see it change as it does it um, I remember way back in the day using uh, terminal programs to download files a lot of times they would show the data on the screen as it transferred because it transferred so slowly you could actually do that um, and so you'd have a you'd have the screen showing 256 bytes and then it would you know 256 different bytes next and um, you, you could kind of see your process that way. So I thought it'd be, the, it'd be nice to do the same thing here. 256 bytes is basically one quarter of the screen area, so we can put that on the screen and still have room to display other things. Um, we'll display progress, um, number of blocks, um, current hashes, so we can show the hashes change as they go along. Um, maybe something else uh, nothing else is coming to mind but we can at least display those things um, so how about length of message maybe something else um, and we can uh, you know, I don't know I guess that's about it we'll see if I think of anything else by next time I'm actually starting this one before I finish the worm program, but that's partly because I don't know. Um, I don't know how big a how big a task this is to bite off until I get into it a little further, a little deeper. So I thought I'd get a little bit of a head start on it, so that if it uh, proves to be difficult, I have a little lead time to make sure I can keep getting my videos out in time. Um, I might I'd have a little bit of a backlog of them to use. So anyway, I think that kind of sums up the summary of this, what this is going to be all about. And the next job is going to be to start laying it out, start laying out these memory locations, um, start writing the functions, and uh, start putting it together. So I hope this is going to be fun, and uh, thank you for watching.